Ahem. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 166, with me, your host, Agostino. What's going on, man? How's it going? How's it feeling? Woohoo! New week, we're back, baby, we're back, we're back again. Back in the hot seat, feeling fresh, feeling fine. A lot better than I have over the last couple of days. I've had a bit of a sickly weekend Um, this weekend, uh, feeling a little bit down in the dumps, feeling a little bit ill. And all that malarkey, um, I'm not sure if it has anything to do with my excessive drinking, but I'm telling myself it does have something to do with that, <laughs> and I'm trying to make some changes um, lifestyle-wise to um, alleviate those issues. Um, again, because, you know, when you're, when you're ill or when you're sick, it's the worst feeling, isn't it? Because you're just so debilitated. Like yesterday, I didn't move at all from my bed, right? Um, you feel just like, you feel like crap, basically. You don't know where to move, you don't know where to look. Yeah, like it, it doesn't feel like it's going to get better. Then you woke up the next day and you're like, oh, here I am. I'm better again. Um, but those first couple of days, especially the, the first 24 hours, man, it's fucking painful just even to go to the toilet. Um, and then you start to contemplate your life decision. You start to think, fuck, man, why did I do that? Why did I do this? Why did I do that? Um, and again, it could be self-inflicted. It could be something that just happened because, you know, it's that time of the year. You get sickness, you get ill, whatever it is. But I've got a feeling it's more to do with um, uh, lifestyle choices that have been kind of leading me to this point that I'm in now. But, you know, again, uh, these things happen and they they happen as a precursor. They happen as a precursor to things that might happen in the future, like a bit of a warning shot. And I think sometimes in life, our responsibility or our, huh, I wouldn't say our main uh, point of life. I'd say maybe um, one of the things about being a human being is that bad shit happens to you and you should use that as a sign to make sure other bad shit doesn't happen to you, right? You kind of, um, it's a bit of a, it's a precautionary tale. Um, we see that a lot with fiction, right? We see that a lot with all biographies, um, with some great literature out there. Sometimes these things are written in order to kind of give us an understanding or a pre-warning of something that might happen in the future and to get us mentally prepared for it uh, or physically prepared for it, whatever it may be. And I think that's what's happened to me too. Um, I think there might need to be a bit of a wake-up call in terms of how I conduct myself and what I do with my life in terms of what I'm go what in terms of going forward now. Um, I just can't continue. I just I, I just don't feel like I continue like this, you know. I can't continue. I think I need to make some changes in order for me to get to kind of AKA the next level, which I don't know what the next level is, but whatever it is, I need to kind of do those changes now, and hopefully, um, that level next level happens. Um, but yeah, apart from that, everything's been fine. Um, weekend was pretty tame didn't do didn't get up too much stayed in for the most part um watched a bit of netflix as per usual um be watching star trek discover which i'm really a big fan of it's a bit drawn out it's probably a no it's annoying that they drop the episodes once every week right it's not like um they don't just dump them on there like they do with most netflix shows they can just binge watch so you have to keep tuning in which is interesting i wonder what the stats say about that because i'm sure there is a there is a very niche hardcore sci-fi fan that exists out there i am one of them that that watches any sci-fi show that comes out um but it's not that probably not as met, probably not enough of us to kind of sustain some shows right some shows get cancelled because you know they just can't justify the production cost um in terms of viewership which is annoying but i wonder what the stats are on netflix side for star, star trek discovery especially dropping them every week i wonder if it's time if the viewership is starting to drop off a bit because I know for me, sometimes I forget um, to check it. But, so then, but then when you do check it, you've got the added advantage that you've got like two episodes to catch up on. But um, apart from that, what else I've been doing? Oh, I've been thinking a lot randomly about Call Me By Your Name. Um, you know, an interesting movie, very seminal movie, something that a movie that really touched me, I think, and a lot of people out there um, in terms of this uh, portrayal of sexuality and uh, of this portrayal of like a coming to age story. You know those annoying coming to age stories where it's like a group of 16 year old kids. And they go on like a road trip somewhere, right? Those are all well and good, but sometimes the the coming to age stories where you have different narratives being weaved into one, right? Loads of different stories being told at once is one of the most interesting ones for me, I think personally. Um, and Queen by Name does a really good job of like not only telling the story of Timothy Chamelet, that actor guy, and the older dude that he kind of has a relationship with, and the the dad and the mum. But the person I was really thinking about a lot in the story was the dad. Um, when he by, when he basically tells Timothy about you know he basically alludes well no no spoiler because you know the film's been out for ages so go check it out if you haven't watched it but um if you haven't probably stop listening now but um the dad says um to the son or kind of 
allude to the idea that he might have also been gay when he was younger, but he didn't have the courage to come out. He didn't have the courage to like, you know, um, uh, he didn't, yeah, he didn't have the courage to come out and do it. And he kind of sacrificed his own desires for the betterment of his family or to, I don't know, whatever I kind of alluded to. And it kind of struck me, that sentence, right? That whole, the whole exchange, right? It was a very touching show. I'm sure a lot of people have had the same sentiment. Um, obviously, there's one eye side of it where there is this, the acceptance from the father's side, right? Understanding what the guy, what the kid is going through, right? This These weird emotions and feelings that he's having of having his first kind of sexual encounter with a man. Also, that man being the first person that he kind of truly loved, right? It's really strange when you're at that age, when you're a teenager and you have like your first love. I know I do. I know I remember who my first love is, right? Um, it's very strange, especially when they reject you. In my case, you bring them a flower when you're 17, no, when you're 15, and they tell you to get the fuck out of it. <laughs> you kind of do some messed up things to you. I laugh about it now, but it's fucking brutal. Imagine going to the uh, fucking Asda and buying one of those fake roses and going to your, your dates, your crush's house, and them telling you to fuck off. But anyway, um, there was something about that, right? Um, there's something very, uh, yeah, there's something, there's something very admirable about the idea of a parent sacrificing themselves, right? On, on adult doing adult things, right? Not give, in order to kind of like make sure their family sticks together. And in a time and age where people are very selfish, right? You watch those shows where there's a show on Bravo at the moment, which I tried to watch a little couple of times, but I couldn't after a couple of episodes where um there'll be a, a couple like you know um a nuclear family uh guy woman whatever two kids a dog whatever it may be called and um one of the one of them uh decides that they want to get sex changed right one of the partners and the kind of doc- reality show goes through the journey of one of the, the person in the group in a couple story kind of coming out quote unquote or stating their attentions to uh their partner and it's such a traumatizing thing to watch, witness. Sometimes it ends quite well. Sometimes it's like, you know, the wife or the husband had a, had an inkling that something was about a bit off about their partner, but they never said anything. Off in the, in the nicest terms, of course. Um, and they kind of help them. They guide them through the whole process and they stick together and they kind of become like this really amazing co-parenting unit. Um, but sometimes it has devastating effects where, you know, just imagine being with somebody. It's, hot, it's bad enough when you're with somebody and you find out they're having an affair, right? <clears throat> That's one thing. But imagine being with somebody and then you're finding out that they were a completely different person inside. They felt like a completely different person, right? They felt like they were living a lie, which, you know, you were kind of, you feel responsible for, um, you know, f- you feel responsible for in some way, shape or form. And then they come out and they want to sex change. And they, sometimes they can just, just destroy the family, right? The kids don't know how to react. It's just like, you know, it's just, you don't really know what that, how much stress that can kind of cause until you, until you watch those kind of shows, you know, and even then you don't, you only have a bit of understanding of it because it's not your, you know, it's not your family. And then you have the kind of, the characters in, um, call me by your name, you know, especially the dad, like putting that to one side in order to kind of have a family and not break up his family and not devastate his wife. It's something, I there's something really admirable about that. I don't know. I just thought about that, but randomly, but Hey, ho, what can you do? Um, that was, the, the, you know, those morning thoughts that you have. Um, but yeah, apart from that, everything's been going on pretty well. Um, as I mentioned previously, got a few DJ dates happening this weekend, Friday at the um, Free Compasses and Saturday at the, at the Heathcote and Star. So if you're around, check those out. You can find out more information on my website, xnozinga.com forward slash DJ gigs. Um, and you'll see it all there. But anyway, let's jump into some topics because that's what we're all here for. Many things I've seen on the internet this, these pa- this past couple, the past week or so that I wanted to talk about. And I'm hoping you guys can join me on this journey. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, number one. So, um, there's a really good. Uh, oh, why isn't this loading properly? I don't know. There's a really good interview. Actually, I, I recommend you check it out. Right? There's a really good um interview happening. Hold on, let me see if I can find it. Da, 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 da. Yeah, there's a really good interview that I saw on um. Resident Advisor. So Resident Advisor, you know, one of my favorite websites to go on most of the times. Um, you know, the kind of quintessential home of electronic music for people that are into DJ culture and all that sort of shit. Um, where is it here? Find it. So really good extra. There's a podcast that they do called the Resident Advisor Exchange, right? And episode number four four seven, which I've got up here on the screen. Um, the hour DJ etiquette, chill out rooms and scene, whatever that word is at the end. 
There's a really good conversation with a few DJs on there. Um, I think it's from minute 37, 17. It says here on the notes, right? Da, 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 da. No, actually, it's um, from 12, 18, right? There's a really good um, little discussion that I recommend that you, you should check out. It's um, As the topic says, it's DJ etiquette. It's a common it's a common term, but what does good etiquette actually look like? Um, non-compliant, debonair, charisma, uh, Paris and, Cher- and Cheryl. Um, who herself was found at the center of a DJ controversy this month, share their useful tips and everything that courteous hands over, hand over to reloads. So um, this kind of was on the back of, I think they were recording anyway, they mentioned, but this is came kind of off the back of um, a, a viral video clip that went from Boiler Room of DJ Sherelle, right? She's playing somewhere and she, you know, she's smashing it, doing her thing. And then one another kind of fellow DJ, she um, pulls up one of her records, right? And it, it kind of got, it kind of doesn't go down well in the room. And um, it was an interesting conversation happened about it, of course, on social. Most of the conversation kind of skewed towards, you know, calling the other DJ names. So much so he had to kind of deactivate his Twitter. He was getting fucking pounded upon. And they called into question the whole power dynamic in electronic music and male hierarchies and patriarchies and entitlements and all this sort of shit. It got a bit political. It got a bit, you know, women's power. It got a bit nutsy, nutty, right? But credit to Sherelle. She didn't really um, fly down that way. She didn't... Um, she, she could have easily stood behind it and made it uh, into a point of spearheading some sort of women's movement. But instead, she kind of just saw it as a disrespectful thing. Like, that wasn't the time or place for it to happen, right? Um, the crowd wasn't... This, uh, anyway, it just didn't seem like she was um, willing to kind of g- go into that kind of a group thing. But it did kind of, you know, bring up an interesting case um, in terms of how... Uh, DJ etiquette is viewed nowadays and things that people don't necessarily think is disrespectful but it's disrespectful one of them being mixing the last song right because it's something that I've kind of had to I've started to do the more confident I've got because I think they were mentioning it before and they were saying that some of them um, some DJs find it very rude when you're the next guy playing or the next person playing starts to mix into the other track right um, and and it's weird because I think when I first started DJing one of the things that happens is that you get really nervous, right? Your first couple of gigs, whatever. Still now, but not so much because you kind of prepare and you know what you're doing. But in the beginning, you get very, very nervous. You just don't want to make a mistake. You don't want to fuck up. And I'm, and one of the things that happens when you don't want to fuck up is that you start you, you will start mixing the track before it ends, right? And the reason why you want to do that is because you want people to know that you're good, and you want to let you you want to kind of convince yourself that you're not shit. So you start mixing the track. It's a very weird. Um, it's a very weird thing, inclination to do, but most I suggest most people that mix the track in before it's ended or the last track doing it because they're nervous. Because the actual really scary thing to do is to do what professional DJs do, especially the ones like Boiler Room, where they let the last track play out towards the end, like just fade out properly, like towards the end. Let the person, let the track play out, let the person get their claps and their hoo has and then they start playing. That a complete uh, fucking palate cleanser of a set. That's the very that's a super experience bit. That's when you see you know, someone knows how to DJ or they've been around the game for a while. I think newer DJs like myself or like, you know, let's say um quote unquote um amateur DJs like myself or weekend DJs, we don't necessarily have that <laughs> um confidence in us yet to do it. And then another bit that came out that was really interesting was um one of the girls I was talking on the on a thing mentioned something quite that's something I've been quite thinking about a lot. Where she mentioned um the quote says something along the lines of um if you don't want to be booked as a warm-up DJ, don't play like a warm-up DJ, right? And that was very interesting to me because um, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because it's something that I've kind of been caught. I've kind of been... I'm kind of in a bit of a... Um, between a rock and a hard place sometimes when it comes to this sort of thing, right? Because um, I'm in a real situation because at the moment, I get booked often, right, to play at these bars and pubs, right? They're not necessarily nightclubs. They're mostly bars and pubs to DJ, which is good, right, it's great, it's amazing, it's giving me the opportunity to kind of play out, um, it's giving me the opportunity to earn a bit of money on the side, it's giving me the opportunity to like, you know, whatever, um, do the thing I love for, that I would probably do for free, um, and it's giving me the chance to get better at DJing, you know, it's, it, it's an amazing thing, I'm really, I'm really fortunate to have it, because not a lot of people get to book out, not, every, not everybody gets to play out as often as I do, or get booked to play out at all, but then there's not, another part of me that's thinking to myself, well, the next step up forward from that is to obviously get regular slots in nightclubs, right? Or to like go on tour or to start playing at festivals, whatever it may be, right? But I'm aware that the only way I can do that is if people hear me play the kind of things they necessarily would hear somebody play that's playing in the, on the main stage or 
or, or you know, one of the biggest clubs in the world. Like, you'd have to play that kind of set. So I don't really know where I'll be able to get a chance to play that kind of set if I'm only playing in bars and pubs, which won't necessarily, you know, I'm, I can't necessarily, I can't exactly play techno, a whole hour of techno in a bar or pub or 30 minutes of it, right? Um, and it go down well in order for people to think, oh, this guy will be good at fabric or this guy will be good at fold. It wouldn't necessarily work that way, right? But there is obviously a part of me that's thinking the only way to know, the only way to show off my skills, the only way to dis- display my range is to kind of play like that in a bar and pub. So sometimes when I've been playing, especially the ones in Dawson now, it's a good, um, this weekend's a good example of it. The Heathcote and Star and Leighton Stone is a bit more of a quieter pub. It's a lot more of an older clientele. So sometimes when I'm playing there, I tend to start slower, right? A lot slower than I would anywhere else, right? And most of the time, because, you know, the, there's like, you know, mums and dads there hanging out. No one really wants to hear banging beats from me. But then when I try to replicate the same thing in Dawson, it doesn't necessarily work because the crowd is a little younger. A lot more of a younger crowd, um, a lot more, I don't know, um, eclectic music taste. So you can, if you want to, go in there and start playing house from nine o'clock and it'll be fine, right? Um, but it's hard to judge what works best. And then plus you don't want to, you know, force people out when they're having a drink on a, on a Friday evening. They don't necessarily want to hear banging beats, just want to hear stuff that's good. They don't necessarily want you to fucking disturb their night. And that's something I've been very conscious about, right? Because I'm sure as most of you guys know, who go to bars and pubs to hang out with your friends, you don't necessarily go there to go see a DJ. It's a, it's a good um, it's a good bonus, right? It's a good little, uh, it's a good extra if they if he or she happens to be good. But for the most part, you're going there for the ambience and then to hang out with your friend and catch up, have some drinks. <clears throat> but you have been, we've all been in positions where, <clears throat> especially <clears throat> a good example being the Captain Hart, Whenever I've been there sometimes with friends, there's always been some fucking terrible DJ playing some fucking god awful tunes. And it kind of puts you off, right? And you kind of just want to leave, especially if you're sitting in and around, in and amongst where the DJ is. But then sometimes there is the idea that sometimes, you know, the pundits don't know what they want until you give it to them. So, again, I don't know what the right step is on that regard. I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. But I have been thinking about it a lot. Like, if I don't want to be booked as a warm-up guy, if I don't want to be booked as the pub and DJ guy, I'm going to have to start playing the stuff that I want to play out loud, out loud in kind of festivals and nightclubs properly. The only other way, the only other option I think outside of that to kind of get recognized in that way is to maybe make mixes, right? And upload those. And, you know, those are quite beneficial. But to be completely honest, in, my, in the, all my life, in all my life, DJ now, I don't think I've ever been booked off the back of a mix I've uploaded online. Never. They're just like things you do for yourself. Um, I, And I don't know any other DJs Especially the ones that are like, you know, um, working leaders who actually get booked on top of all that. I think they get booked for playing out. People hear them and then they book them again. Um, which is weird. It doesn't really, or nowadays with Boiler Room, it works that way, right? Boiler Room with um, the many festivals that get streamed online. That's 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 worked as a, as like a kind of, that's been a good way to kind of get people on. So you kind of get that recorded, you upload it, and then people hopefully see your thing. It goes viral and then you can kind of get bookies off the back of that. Um like that one DJ that was DJing is it in Iran or whatever it was in the Middle East somewhere you know, on Boiler Room that fucking smashed it and now she's probably got bookings coming out of her ass. Um, that's a good way to kind of get exposure to, for yourself. But I don't know. Without that, on my without that kind of ability, to, without that thing in my lane, I don't know what, exactly what the best thing to do. But I need to kind of figure it out. But I recommend you check it out. DJ, um, the hour on Resident Advisor, DJ Etiquette, Chill Out Rooms, and um, kind of talks about this whole topic. I recommend you check it if you're interested in those kind of things. Um, next on the list is I wanted to mention briefly because I think this is quite a good topic to kind of talk about is um, Paris Fashion Week, right? How it's happen- is happening or is, is going to kind of wound down soon, wind down. And there's been an interesting thing that's happened, right? And something that kind of like speaks on the whole idea of race and, you know, um, cultural influence and what's happening with hip-hop now in america and i've just been seeing a bit of a culture shift right something's happening in the air i don't know what it is but there's something happening so um virgil abloh you know the designer at creative director at louis vuitton and the designer and founder of off-white and many other things underneath his belt the um, debuted his show at the, um you know did another off-white collection at uh paris fashion week right then let me get it up on here and there's been an interesting thing that's happened i've seen online People have been really, um, people have been really questioning what's, what the role of fashion criticism, 
um, in in the wake of what Virgil's doing at um, Louis Vuitton and what he's doing at Off White, because of his race, which is interesting, right? Because we we don't I don't think we've ever been in this position before. Previously, I think it might have happened. I think maybe the most recent example I can think of is maybe the thing that's happened at the Oscars, right? Where there was you know years on years, you know, the controversy with Kevin Hart, the fact that some films weren't recognized, the fact that you know Black Hollywood kind of feels that like they they kind of get shunned in those awards, then they felt like um to make up for it um. Oscars, the Oscars did a, bit of a big IRU session and handed awards out to everyone that they, they could have handed out to um, list of nominees that was black or female, right? They came, it felt it felt like that, right? Just from the outside looking in, which is ne- not necessarily a bad thing, you know, trying to re- rewrite your wrongs, but when it, it, sometimes it can be a bit heavy handed, right? You want to, you want people to make sure, you want people to know that they got their awards through merit. You don't want it to be felt like it's a kind of a bit of a charity case, but you know, that's neither here or there. But it's interesting thing happened with fashion with Virgil, where you're seeing you're seeing an understanding or an acceptance of just how much power and influence he seems to have and the people in and, among, in and around him, right? Um, for, for you know, like it or not, um, Virgil Abloh, Heron Preston and Matthew Williams have become like the, the, the quasi um, power structure, right? The cultural um, figureheads of fashion nowadays, right? They have their actual finger on the pulse, right? Matthew Williams and stuff he's doing with Dior, um, Heron Preston with the litany of projects he's doing, working with Nike and all this sort of stuff, right? Um, being one of the judges, I think was he a judge or was he around just when the LVMH Prize was doing whatever? You know, they're in the mix, right? They're they're the main people that people go to when they want um to be culturally relevant. But the issue with Virgil is that some people just don't think his clothes are good, right? So, and I'm one of them, right? I think the stuff he does at Louis Vuitton is fucking banging, which I always knew it would be because he's get give he's got he's got the resources, the production value, the manufacturing and production um levels to bring his vision, to deliver his vision at the highest level, right? But I think sometimes with the off-white, you know, for the most part, it looks a little bit haberdashery, looks a little bit clunky, just because, you know, maybe the, the team that's around him isn't necessarily that experienced or whatever it may be. There's something quite, you know, um, sh- I wouldn't say shit, but quite um, amateurish about the way off-white feels, right? It's kind of, a, it's, it, you can feel like, he, he's that brand you can feel like it's something that he has full control over right it's, everything is i don't know you just can tell the difference about it right but sometimes you don't and especially with it in light of his louis vuitton show you really get to see the contrast and quality levels between his off-white and, and louis vuitton louis vuitton is really really high level and off-white isn't as good now some people would argue and say louis vuitton isn't that high level but i honestly do think louis vuitton the stuff he did in louis vuitton is really good but the off-white stuff not so much and I've seen a big conversation online, especially with a few fashion critics, where they've kind of been bemoaning the fact that no one wants to be honest and say anything because, number one, he's the most influential person on the scene. And number two, it seems like they don't want to say anything for the risk of sounding racist, right? Which is which is peculiar because we're in an industry, especially fashion, where, you know, it suffered a lot with um, representation. It suffered a lot with, in I won't say inclusivity, but... The idea that you know there's only a particular rep- there's only a particular vision that gets kind of promoted or gets kind of given jobs. I think Kanye West spoke about it with his interview with Shane Oliver. The fact that you know um, Hedy Cement's been given four opportunities to design at major houses. Um, he's been given what well, I think four gigs or whatever it may be, and other other designers, especially people that come from um, kind of you know other backgrounds, maybe get one opportunity. And that's it. Uh, and he gets the opportunity to deliver his vision at the highest level again and again and again. And it's the same shit again and again and again. Um, whereas it would be maybe a bit more interesting to kind of give, you know, some of these other dudes and ladies a bit of a chance to do something on that level too. So there's been a big problem with that in general. Now it feels like nowadays, especially with the direct-to-consumer model, you can effectively bypass all of those gatekeepers and just do it on your own, like Virgil did, and um, then get the attention of all the big brands and then you get kind of headhunted by Louis Vuitton, and here you are, right? So it can kind of it can work out that way, but it doesn't always have doesn't work always that way. That way, and not everyone has the ability to start up their own brand like um, Virgil did, right? Not everyone wants to do that. Some people just want to get a job in a in a big house, and that's not a bad thing. But it's interesting to see the shift that's happening where people are afraid to say anything about Virgil because they don't want to be looked at that way. But I'm also very curious to know because again, like I said, the the collection is here on the screen. I don't necessarily think it was a good collection. I don't think it was one of his strongest, um, especially the off-white thing. I think maybe one of his weakest collections, but it's just the fact that there are good pieces in it, but as an overall, it just doesn't feel cohesive, right? It doesn't feel like... It just, doesn't, it just feels really clunky. It feels really mismatched. But then a part of me is like, I think there's maybe a bigger play involved in this when you're Virgil, right? 
with what's happening now in society with the fact that there was that kid recently in America that got shot walking away from the police officer unarmed, right? There's this now movement that's been happening with especially, you know, with she with the Rock Nation brunches and that kind of power and influence that these hip hop artists have and how they're trying to use it in other ways, like Meek Mill with prison uh with prison reform and you know, um, with Jay Z and and the numerous things that he's doing behind the scenes, it seems like these prominent black celebrities and entertainers are realizing that they need to use their power and or influence and segue into other cultural, social um, issues that can be to the betterment of black people in general, right? Or black, black and brown people overall. And I sometimes think to myself, with the fashion industry being as fucked up as it is, right? With them promoting only one singular vision that maybe it's quite beneficial to have a Virgil around, even if the stuff that he does isn't that good, right? It's more important to have him here and, and then a kid to come up. Because imagine, I always think to myself when I see these people, um, I think to myself, like, if I was 16 and I saw a Virgil doing what he's doing, I saw an ASAP Rocky wearing the clothes that he wears, I saw Travis Scott making the music that he does, I saw a Tyler the Creator creating a world that he's been creating, right? Um... I would be so inspired, right, to do my own thing. I wouldn't want to kind of be uh, beholden to anyone, right? I'd want to kind of go in, make my own brand, start my own zine. Uh, I don't know, uh, create my own skate team, uh, start making music on the side under a pseudonym. Like, I'd want to do all that shit because these people showed me that I could do it. And I think the fact that kids nowadays know what a creative director is, they kind of aspire to be one um, instead of just being an employee at Nike like my generation were was kind of infatuated with um, about getting free shoes and all that shit um about you know jumping the queue out store about you know attending gallery events all that bullshit now these kids want to be you know they want to be the next virgil right and i think that's amazing and i think maybe that's the more important play i think the fact that he doesn't do great work sometimes is neither here or there i think as well there is a part of me that's also like there's a part of me that thinks with these fashion critics he doesn't have as much experience as the bigger designers out there right um you can't necessarily put him in the same and that's probably why he doesn't really um categorize himself as a fashion designer in that regard but what he's very good at is understanding what's currently going on in culture tapping into it and kind of uh, delivering you products right when it comes to the belt that i wear all the time that's a fucking amazing piece when it comes to the trainers that he does when it comes to some of the jackets he might do when it comes to stuff that he's done with louis vuitton he's able to kind of you know, take these things, and even with music stuff, right, there's something about his understanding of culture that's very, very, very rare. But I also think, like I said, I also think it's just important to have him here just as a kind of representation of what's kind of currently going on. And obviously, again, as a as a, as a bit of an inspiration for kids coming up. Because like I said, if you're 16 and you're seeing a Virgil doing what he's doing in Paris, you can't help but be inspired. Now, if whether it's good or not, it's neither here or there, but I think you have to, you have to be inspired. Um... But again, like I said, I don't feel this question was very good. Um, I don't know why it looks like this. I don't know why you look at this and then you look at something like from Balenciaga and you don't realize why it's not good. But then you think about it like, oh, it makes sense because, you know, um, Demma for Balenciaga is like, you know, he's a quote unquote quintessential d- d- designer, right? I think he mentioned in an interview recently that he can actually make a jacket. Like he's, he can tailor things. He's a pattern cutter. So maybe that's po- that's the point of it. But um wasn't my favorite collection but I, I, I like i said i just think it's interesting to see what's happening in fashion criticism where people feel a bit scared to say anything about him because he's that much of an influence that much of a uh, cultural um, head figure and people don't want to look like they're you know coming at his neck only because he's black but again interesting to see how it develops going forward interesting to see whether or not it gets better off white because so far it hasn't got any better um and yeah, and just see where it goes from there. But again, um, it's just interesting to see what, 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 how it's being played out in fashion at the moment. Um, how it's been played out is very, very interesting to me. And just in general, isn't it? it's just interesting to see the, con- the kind of criticism that he kind of gets in general from these press people. Especially considering some of the cacks some of the other fashion designers put out on the runway. It seems like everything he does is always kind of, you know, scrutinized a little bit more heavily than others. But again, I don't know why, what it is. Maybe because behind the scenes, he might be a bit of a dickhead. I don't know. Um, but it's, it seems it doesn't seem like that from the outside. He seems to put on all his friends. He seems to provide jobs for loads of people, opportunities for loads of people. Um, he's not afraid to you know um you um to kind of get people on from fucking Instagram to kind of help him out and shit and put them on payroll, which is fucking awesome. Um, stuff that he doesn't have to do again. Um, he's he has really tore down the walls of the gatekeepers or whatever maybe. Um, he kind of pulls away from being gatekeeper himself. There's only good I can see for his contribution in terms of you know. 
you know, for people in fashion. Whether not the clothes are good is another thing, but you know, again, these are just opinions, isn't it? What the fuck do we know? And I guess balancing the many projects that he does, you're you're bound to kind of have a dud or two here and there, isn't it? But um and then the second one I wanted to talk about was we have it here? Yeah, is Balenciaga, right? Um them that Balenciaga, I don't know, like uh, this this collection for me it's just um brilliant really. Um debuted, right? Four winter um collection debuted and he off the I think during the run up of the of the collection he had an interview with uh ww wwd magazine and um he spoke he spoke quite candidly about you know this idea that he likes ugly and it's not not necessarily true what other people deem as ugly he obviously deems as beautiful which is obviously a great example explanation for it he kind of detailed about the inspiration that came um that kind of brought about the triple s sneaker um um the fact that he hates small feet on guys he doesn't like the idea of a small silhouette on the guy's foot which is quite interesting because i remember um, ages ago, I'm not sure if it's true anymore, but I remember back in the day, um, what some some guy that had a shop, who was that? I forgot who had a shop. Uh, someone I knew back in the day that had that had a store. I remember them saying something along the lines of, um, when Kanye came to visit one time, he was he was kind of adamant that he had to wear a shoe two two sizes up from what his actual shoe size was. I think Kanye maybe was an eight, and he actually bought a ten or something. And um, I think he had like he's bit, he's got a bit of a conscious, a bit of a what's the thing called? What's that word called? He's got some, anyway. He's worried about how his small, small his feet look, right? So he purposely would buy bigger, bigger shoes in order to make his feet look big, which is bizarre to me because I remember when I was in school, um, I've always kind of been a, I, I've always I had a big foot when I was in school, then it kind of stopped growing. So now I'm about size ten, maybe in eleven in running shoes, right? But when I was in secondary school and I was fifteen, sixteen, I was a size nine, ten then, and the, back then you know everyone had smaller feet. People had eights and sevens and nines, and you know you could you could get uh, better shoes on sale. Blah blah blah. So I kind of suffered a lot from having kind of flapper feet, right? And people used to take the piss out of me. So I would always try and buy my shoes smaller, or try and buy them half a size down and take out the insole, right? So I'd kind of have my my feet curled up as a knuckle at the front of it, and kind of you know I'll be dying with my feet bleeding on the inside, but at least they look good. And that's the kind of silhouette you want. You want a really small shoe. So it's interesting to see that kind of thing being flipped nowadays, where most people want to have a big chunky shoe at the, uh, at the bottom of their foot. But he speaks about that, and that's that, that being the inspiration um, behind uh, Triple S, which makes sense because whenever you see Demna in actual real life or pictures of him walking around the streets, he's always wearing uh, New York boots, right? Those kind of like big uh, goth boots that guys wear um, with, the metal, with the metal on the front and shit. Um, he's always wearing really massive boots, so um, it's not surprising to see that he did that. Uh, but I'm also surprised that he hasn't he's done an official collaboration with Dr. Martens. He has, hasn't he? Yeah, he did. He did it uh, with the Vetemar. I was just thinking, he should do a collaboration with, with um, Thingy, but especially with the Jaden. I think that would be sick, and a Vetemar and Jaden would be fucking awesome. But anyway, that being said, um, the interview is really good, really um, illuminating, but it also details the fact that because obviously, um, Bill Saga 4 Winter Collection debuted in Paris, and he kind of speaks about the idea of scrapping, doing away with pre collections, doing away with resort collections, right? And this coming off the back of Karl Lagerfeld passing away recently and him being, you know, just a fucking absolute workhorse, right? Working across many different brands, working across many different seasons, or or d- delivering many collections a year. Um, and it seemed like, you know, it was it, maybe the the toll of the work finally did him over, or whatever it may be, I don't know. Um, but it seems like he's, he's one of a kind, right? And a lot of designers out there complain about the workload that modern designers have or the pressures that they're under. And um, this kind of segued into Balenciaga presenting like, you know, over 100 looks for his collection because he decided to put um, a lot of menswear in. It's a co-ed show. So there was men's and women's presented in this fashion show and anything that would have been um, uh, left or put aside for the resort collection was kind of included here. And in my opinion, it was one of the strongest, strongest shows on the Fashion Week calendar. And I think the reason why it's strong for me personally in the same way Junior, in the same way Khan, in the same way Com is, in the same way um, Noir is, um, in the same way that J.W. Anderson is, same way Luebe is, in the same way Givenchy maybe to a certain extent is, in the same way Valentino is. They're just, just looking at it, you can tell it's different to anything else that exists on the market. It's just a step above everything else that's on there. It's just, the quality is insane, the the shapes, um, the textures, the colors, 
it's just amazing, right? And you know for sure everything that you're seeing on this runway is going to be co-opted or taken apart by other brands and then put into their shows. And that's, I think, the biggest compliment you can pay to someone like Demna. He just seems to have his finger on the pulse and get everything. And this show, in my opinion, again, was probably one of his strongest. And he did away with all the fancy glitz and glamour of the previous show that was, you know, very much high on the production quality, right? In that me an amazing tunnel. Um... But this is just like straight up amazing clothes from the collection all the way through. Um, so many bits and pieces of it that I absolutely loved. Again, loads of the checkered stuff that we saw at um, Virgil's show for Off-White that was based, I think, on the Duchamp uh, book with the checkerboard on it, I'm pretty sure. But just loads of interesting uh, pieces that were just in, that just really, really um, spoke to me. And again, I just he's just one of my favorite designers Devin, out on the scene at the moment. The, what he has done in his ability to deliver on like an artistic art project level with Vetsamar and then what he does here on the commercial quote unquote level with Blench Yoga is really, really incredible. And I think we're only, we're not really um, giving him his flowers while he's around. But I think once he's gone, I think people look back at his time Blench Yoga and think, fuck man, that was some high level shit. Like really was some high level shit. Um, and just the aesthetic of it, right? The idea that he's kind of promoted this idea of... Uh, ugliness or this idea of a street um fashion to this luxury level is insane really in general because i remember that in a period of time there was this idea that you know that parisian chic that kind of shiny shiny sheeny look was the only way to be you know stunning or the only way to look chic or look modern but look he's kind of, he's made this what would you call it a rugged eastern european look or this it's just whatever it is it's very him and very um on point with what he does at Vetimar. But again, just a, a cleaner, updated version. And even if it looks like this, like with all the bags, like you just can't deny this, man, how good this is. You just can't deny how good that is. The boots with the emblem on the front of it, just amazing, 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 amazing collection. Um, over 100 looks, I'm not gonna go through them entirely, but I really recommend you check them out. Um, there was an interesting thing that actually with the tops of the jacket, I'm not sure what this is about, where it was kind of looks like it's folded and then st st sewed over on top again. I'm not sure what that's about, but it does a really, it brings up a really interesting silhouette off the back, so it kind of makes it pull up a bit from the back of it, which is quite cool. Um, if you can see that there, da -da -da -da. let's continue here. But again, just interesting piece overall, like, you know, great stuff that everyone can wear. Colors, neon overcoat, nice jacket it's great bag these these track pants are going to be everywhere let's let me just tell you that now right uh blend saga track pants like they're going to be everywhere like literally everywhere if people if people are obsessed with those needless track pants imagine what they're going to do with these um blend saga track pants i'm sure i'm pretty sure they might come in different colorways but maybe not maybe just going to stay with the traditional um the quintessential athletic navy blue with a white stripe on the side of it but yeah just fucking great shit man great great shit it's all, cool. it's all really good all really good all really high quality um and again i can't wait to see the stuff in stores when it lands just amazing stuff again from Demna. um easily easily one of my favorite designers on the runway now at the moment again and he does an amazing he's always got an ability to make a really good ski jacket isn't it like this knows what to do with these kind of things. i'm not sure if he buys vintage um ski jackets um from like uh charity shops and stuff and then just updates them but he's always got a very good eye of making the, that kind of quintessential the perfect ski jacket right um the slanted pockets here in the front the extended neck right um that covers your neck for the most part right just really really cool stuff um i really highly recommend you check this out again nice leather jacket here again uh, some of the jackets here are fucking incredible to be honest i love them all um, there's a blue one here as well. I want to see. That. I want to show you. That was fucking awesome. The neck on those jumpers is fucking cool as well. Uh, where is it? It's coming up. Neon, 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 neon. Yeah, that jacket here. That's really cool, right? So, a ski jacket, and he's he's kind of. I don't know if he's like he's basically puffed up the sleeves a bit. It looks fucking insane, isn't it? I'm not sure how that was achieved there. It does like pulled apart a little bit, but it looks incredible, doesn't it? Looks really cool. Like, honestly, it looks really, really high quality. And again, just the production level is just amazing. Um, Just really cool. And a massive funnel, like, you know, protects you against the elements. Anyway. Let's continue. Um, That's it. I recommend you check that out. Devna uh, collection for Balenciaga. Spring for this fall winter collection, actually. I recommend you check that. Uh, what's next on the list here? 
Can't show disappear from the screen, camera. That no, I'll come back. Anyway, what's next on this? Oh, um, oh yeah, talking about the interview with uh, Kanye Shane Oliver. So Shane Oliver sat down with um, Kanye West um, to have a really good, in- really good discussion about all things fashion. It seems like Shane is gearing up for uh, a-, a comeback. He's bringing back Hood by Air, um, the much uh, coveted brand, the brand that maybe kind of gave Virgil this kind of um, uh, what you call it platform too. I seem to remember he was. Um, helping out with doing graphics for them in the beginning as well as when he, he was kind of doing his thing with Pyrex, I think, during that sort of time. So, you know, it's got it's steeped in history. Shane Oliver being the quintessential kind of uh, New York um, streetwear alumni in that respect, um, quasi-alumni, whatever you may call it. But it seems like he's making his comeback to fashion. I mean, he took a bit of a break and took a step back for the most part. I'm sure someone like him didn't take a complete step back. I'm sure he was doing things on the low low for other brands designing consulting whatever it may be but um it seems like more than ever his voice is probably more necessary than ever it seems like he's probably feeling a little bit of fomo right with um the new york fashion scene is at the moment there's loads of interesting designers there like echoes lata and um telfar and stuff doing fucking awesome shit so he probably feels like you know it's necessary to kind of you know uh put his voice out there back again but um, it did seem like towards the end, it was getting a little bit shit. It was getting a bit watered down, hood by air. I'm not sure if that had anything to do with Shane Love. I'm not sure if that had to do something to do with distribution. But it seemed like to, it seemed to lose its kind of cool points. I know Shane had a big falling out with um, ASAP Rocky during that time. Right, I think ASAP Rocky kind of felt a bit used by the brand or something. I don't know what happened there. It didn't seem like they were kind of getting on that regard. I'm not sure if he wanted to get paid or whatever it may be. But it seemed that something was happening towards the end of um, hood by air that kind of, you know, we should have known that it would have stopped. But now maybe he's recharged batteries and want to come back. But this conversation with Kanye is very interesting, very illuminating in the in this idea in the side of Kanye West because you know you can kind of tell his infatuation with fashion and in the industry overall. Um, and also, it's interesting to see how Shane Oliver views his work that he's doing himself, right? Um, how he positions himself amongst other people, um, how he thinks Hold by Air can work again, being introduced to the market. Um, but I really recommend you check it out. I've, it's a really illuminate conversation. It's, it's something that Interview Magazine are always really good at doing. Um, it's happy that they kind of got resurrected for, you know. I'm happy they got resurrected in that regard. Um, the, the idea that they can have these two, they have, you know, two big um, celebrities talk to each other and interview each other. I think you get a real interesting dynamic, um, especially when it's someone like a Kanye West and a Shane Lillard sitting down and talking about fashion. Um, than you would do maybe here with him and a journalist. I recommend you check that out. It's called Shane Lover tells Kanye West that he won't be rushed um, into creating the future of streetwear. Um, it's a really good um, interview. Kind of talks about how, how they balance, how he balances, how how he's trying to balance his workload and the pressures of being in the industry, blah, 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 blah. I recommend you check out a really inter- interesting interview. Um, next, in, uh, I'll put it actually in the show notes for you guys to check out too. And the Demna one. Um, next topic to talk about here is something quite sad and something that I didn't really want to talk about, but you know, I guess now is now better than ever. It's probably a good time to talk about it because the case has been concluded. Um, but yeah, um, a guy that I know, um, Sion, unfortunately has been charged with manslaughter, um, of his get of his dang girlfriend. Um, it was an interesting story, interesting case, something that was quite like you know took me aback at the time that it happened um i remember there was a, an occasion a few years a couple of maybe a couple of years ago or maybe it was a year ago i don't know when it was but i was out at a party and i remember um seeing sion and just hanging out because you know i used to see him on the scene a lot um he used to hang around with the same people that i used to hang around with sometimes and you know i took a bit of a backseat i haven't been out with those guys in a while but you know we know the same people and i remember um me being out and i remember seeing um Seeing seeing a friend before I saw Sion and him telling me, Oh, have you heard about Sion? What happened? I was like, No, what happened? And he kind of told me, but I think I was maybe in a bit of a drunken stupor, so I don't remember the story. And then I saw him again, and he just seemed a bit off, right? You know, someone just seems a bit off, seemed a bit out of it, but I just, you know, I, I just chalked it up to drugs. I chalked it up to drug drinking. I didn't really think anything of it. <coughs> and then this story comes out that supposedly, um, he was responsible for his girlfriend's death, right? Because they were at a festival. And the story, here's how the story goes, that they were, they were at a festival and they were taking drugs in the forest off-site somewhere. And she started tripping out because um, I think he must have upped her dosage. And um, he was hesitant to call the ambulance or to call the you know, medical services because he, he had an, uh, a warrant out for his arrest or, or something along those kind of lines and he didn't want to get in trouble again. And because of his negligence, she ended up dying, right? Alone in the forest. Um... And it was a really, really, really tough thing to read. 
because however you read it, however it kind of got painted, it looked like it was gross negligence. It looked like Sion was just the worst boyfriend in the world, right? Um, it looked like a story of just pure and utter selfishness and carelessness. And it seemed, and a really sad story because when you dig a, dig deeper a bit and you find out what, what, how their relationship was and you find out whether or not he was a good boyfriend or not, you what you do find out is that this girl was absolutely, in, she was head over heels in love with Sion. Like she loved him. She worshipped the ground he walked on. Um, some of her friends didn't necessarily think he was a good match for her or you know or he he was um, worthy of her presence or whatever it may be but you know if you're if, if that's your mate and they really love the person and even if you don't think they're the right person for them you just you know they're your friend what are you gonna do um you're just gonna love and appreciate the person for they for what they are and you're gonna but you're gonna keep your eye open but all i hear back from the friends that i've spoken to who know them a bit better than i do have said that she absolutely adored this guy right and that's what's that's just a really heart wrenching thing about it. That she adored him, the person that she adored, the person that is meant to be her quote unquote protector, is meant to kind of look after her best interests, is the one that was responsible for her death. Not only in the uh, supplying of the drugs, and but also in the case of not getting her the help that she needed um, when it started to turn left. And oh, it's just gut wrenching, man. It's just so gut wrenching. It's just so so gut wrenching, and um, yeah. So this, it's been concluded. He got charged with manslaughter. I think he got sentenced to eight years. Um, this is a story here on the BBC. Um, it says the following: um, A man who gave his girlfriend the drugs at the festival and filmed her as she died has been found guilty of manslaughter. Uh, Luella Fletcher Machi was found dead in the woodland near Festival site, um, Dorset, after taking the drug two PCP. Uh, Sion um, Bruton did little to help her uh, help his girlfriend, the daughter of Harvey City actor John Mitchie, uh, for six hours as he feared breaching a suspended jail term. Um, he filmed Miss Fletcher Mitchie, 24, and branded her a drama queen as she lay dying on the September 11th, 2017, which is nut nuts, right? Um, Brother 30 of Island Centre, Enfield, London, was found guilty at the Winchester Crown Court of supplying the Class A drug. Both verdicts were unanimous and he is due to be sentenced on Friday. Um, he did get sentenced. Uh, speaking outside the court, Mr. Mitchie said, regardless of the outcome of the hiring or trial, there are never going to be any winners. We begin our life sentence on what would have been Luella's 25th birthday and uh, Sion life sentences knowing that he didn't help her live. And it's just... Yeah, man. Um, It's just gut-wrenching, isn't it? It's just fucking gut-wrenching. It's just something that you don't necessarily kind of wrap your head around how that could happen and how that was acceptable in his head. Um, it got even more distressing when the trial kind of, you know, started to unravel and you hear that he kind of put in a plea of not guilty and you're just like, what, dude? Like, have a little bit of honour, have a little bit of class. Um, but, you know, maybe that's asking too much and maybe in his head he probably didn't do anything wrong. Um, but again, man, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, you know, just sad, man. It's a sad fucking story all around. Um family loses a daughter he loses he's he kind of life is over um so yeah sad state of affairs uh she was found guilty by she was found um dead by a security guard or security steward on 400 meters from the site the court heard a couple um like to film each other when they were taking drugs and the jurors were shown footage of the or from the day in which Broughton could be seen playing with a fidget spinner um Broughton then filmed his girlfriend as she became disturbed, agitated, and then seriously ill, and continued recording after her apparent death. Um, at an angry exchange in the court on the 21st between Fletcher Mitchie's father and Broughton can now be reported. During a break in proceeding, Mr. Mitchie shouted, Evil, evil, and not even sorry, as his family walked towards an exit. Broughton grabbed the wooden table and threw it against a wall, breaking it into pieces. He then stormed into the waiting area to another courtroom and damaged a water cooler before being restrained by police and his legal team jesus christ during the trial the, the court heard bruton had contacted friends and fletcher mitchell's family uh, sending them a uh, map showing his location uh, her parents drove 130 miles from london to the festival um, but when fletcher mitchell's brother sam also contacted bruton urging him to seek medical help he called her a drama queen and told him to call back in an hour fletcher mitchell told uh, the court that when he asked Bruton what drugs his sister had taken, Bruton had told him two PCP, but I did, I bumped it up a bit. The defense barrister, Steve Chemister, said that no one has ever known to die from taking PCP or, or, or taking an overdose. Which is sad, isn't it? She was the first girl ever to die of that drug, but she only died because he didn't get her medical help. It's fucking insane. Um, 
the angry exchange is weird too because again i just don't know what goes through someone's head when that happens right you're in court with the family of the girl that you're responsible for her death um you don't show any remorse and somehow you get angry that the fact that they're branding you evil like you get frustrated i don't know if that's like a, a like a reaction people have when they're getting called out it's like a nervous twitch you kind of have to point the finger back but what are you doing you fucked up man um Again, I don't know how why that is what happens, but it seems to happen a lot. It's like when someone gets called out for lying. The first thing they do is get super defensive about their liar. But in this case, I didn't necessarily see what the how he could what reaction what other reaction he could have apart from pleading with the family that he was sorry, right? Um and asking them for forgiveness. Cause essentially he was responsible for her murder. Um and again, you just don't like to think that's true. You don't like to think that you know, again, it's just the law of averages. I probably do know somebody has killed somebody, but it's a tough one to take, man. We used to hang out, man. You know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't say we're, we're best buddies or anything, but we used to hang out. We exchanged messages to each other on Instagram here and there. Just a sad state of affairs, man. A really sad state of affairs. And again, it's just, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And again, if you're, if you're like, again, nothing to do with him because it's not nothing his fault, but. It's a weird thing, isn't it? If you're a skeptic, right? Um, two of these, two people within his kind of extended circle, Sion and um, the guy Solo Forty Five, are in very peculiar, very pe- precarious positions. Solo Forty Five allegedly being accused of rape, um, Sion being uh, convicted of manslaughter. Uh, it's fucking insane, isn't it? Like two people from your group have been um, committed to these fucking heinous crimes. Again, nothing to do with him. Again, but. You kind of have to, I'm, I'm sure, in his regard, I'm because I'm pretty sure the last few weeks or last few months, I haven't necessarily been seeing, seeing, hanging around with them that much, but wild situation, man. Wild situation. Um, and again, because that, that, that's the thing that makes it even more, that's a map of where she, that's thing that makes it even more harrowing because, you know, um, the family had to, were, knew something was up and they raced from London to, the site, but he didn't get there in time enough, and I, and I bet they fucking got caught, um, caught up about it, right? Think, probably thinking, ah, oh, what could we have done? Could we have got there sooner? But yeah, sick situation, man. I'm kind of want to get off this now. It's kind of bumming me out, but yeah, um, my thoughts and feelings are out to the uh, Fletcher Mitchie family, and uh, yeah, man, just hope that they can heal from this awful, awful thing, man. And again, I don't know. People just have to be safe for these drugs thing, man. Like, for all well and good taking them, but most sites, most festivals have uh, um, medical staff on site in in case someone does get a bit, uh, you know, um, go. If someone does have uh, a bad reaction to a drug, there is someone on hand to help. And I know sometimes it can be you can feel a little bit scared to go because you know you are on drugs which are illegal. But I think that you know it's far better. It's it's I it's far better option to feel to get in trouble right to maybe get a slap on the wrist maybe get fined maybe get spend a night in the cell but to know your friends are okay and they're alive then to take the chance um to not seek medical help and for them to die and flat blood to be in your hands forever right it's something you have to live with for the rest of your life that's something that you probably don't wish on your worst enemy but again man some some people just have fucked up ways of showing their love and affection to people in it i guess <clears throat> but Let's move on. What is next on the list here? Oh, Jordan Peterson interview in Australia. I recommend you check that out. Why did I put this on here? Uh, blah, 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 blah. I need to put the clip. Oh, there was this really interesting exchange, actually. Jordan yeah, so Jordan Peterson is on tour in, in Australia now. At the moment. I'm not sure if he's back already. Um, New Zealand, Australia. And wherever he goes, it seems to, you know, he seems to have bevy of people protesting his presence everywhere, which is really bizarre considering how how tame his opinions are for the most part it seems like you know people have have it um set in their minds that he's kind of their enemy um but a really good exchange that he had here with this lady in a q a during this q a in australia where she's kind of you know doing that thing that people do where they make statements and then ask questions and then insult you in the same breath and joel peterson does a really good job of kind of dismantling her i want to play a little bit of it now um let me get this off screen so no one has to see this hopefully i don't get pulled off youtube for it oh and talking about youtube i, I hit one fan subscribers i let you know did, then, did you guys know that i've got one fan subscribers on youtube which is awesome um which means i might be earning some coinage on my videos not much because i don't really have as many views as most other people but it's a good start man it's a start one thousand views is a kind of threshold for you to kind of earn money on ads and shit 
which is cool. And yeah, interesting journey to go on. But anyway, let's go back to this Jordan Peterson video. Um, here he is talking at, uh, where is it? Da, 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 da. ABC, uh, is it ABC? ABC, whatever. Anyway, it's, it's a QA. and a doesn't matter. This woman's on screen. He asks Jordan Peterson a question and he goes and does Jordan Peterson does. I want to know what is your answer uh, to young people for some of the really big uh, uh, problems facing humanity like the you know climate catastrophe like economic crisis like the precarious job market because they just don't like you talk all this much about uh, individual responsibility most of us are never going to be able to afford uh, to have all of these assets to have responsibility over so what is your advice beyond banal comments like clean your room well, you know, it's actually rather difficult to answer a question that ends with your comments are banal, politely. <laughs> so, you know, I, I would, I would consider best. that more of an opinionated personal and political statement than actually a question. So why don't you try reformulating that so that there's an actual question there. <laughs> Brutal! <laughs> and again, a part of me is like, I get it, right? I think sometimes in, when you're in a room with a, uh, with a very smart person or an intellectual, there is a tendency to want to display your intellectual prowess too. And I think we all do it. It's like, the, it's like when you're in a room with somebody and they're speaking about a festival or about them going on a holiday or about them going on tra traveling, wherever it may be, right? About them... Even sometimes when you're in a room with someone that fights, right? Sometimes there is a guy who has that thing about them where they try and, then, you know, tell their story about when they got into a fight. You know, there's something about that, that, that story exchange where you want to also be a part of it. But there is also a part of me that's also like, what's wrong with these people when they want to debate or they want to take on someone like a Jordan Peterson, a Sam Harris, um, or whatever it may be, right? People that who are, in general, who are paid, who are kind of on this planet to think very deeply about topics, right? They meditate. They read books a lot, day in, day out, right? Whilst we're watching Netflix, whilst I'm recording a stupid podcast, scratching my balls, farting, they are sitting down studying. They're, they're tearing through essay papers. They're tearing through um, uh, literature. They're tearing through autobiographies, interviews, legislation. They're going through shit again and again with a fine tooth comb. And then they're formulating their own point of view with all the information that they've gathered. But yet here you are, yeah, right? This social justice warrior who's just, I don't know, um, read a few blogs, read a few articles, has gone to a couple of rallies and consumed some TED Talks and you think you have the, um, the, the tools available to take him on. Like, what's wrong with you? Again, I, I don't know what's wrong with people when they, when they have process that kind of thing through their mind. What do you think happens there? Again, it might just be a, the idea that he's in the room, so why not? But the, it can't end well for you. It really can't. <laughs> so what is your advice to young people when you talk about you need to be individually responsible, but when there are things that are so far out of our control, like climate catastrophe, like the precarious job economy, like... The They're not as far crisis. out of your control what, what is, as you what think. Is, what is your answer? Do you think that you're worse off than your? Do you think that you're worse off than your grandparents? I think there are different challenges. Do you think you're worse off than your grandparents? Uh, I think that Jordan, once again, we're not going to cross-examine our questions. Uh, so <laughs> try answering the question about collective responsibility on climate change, for example. Pick pick one part of that, uh, because the argument I think is. The individual responsibility does not change um, the climate, does not fix the problem that needs global collective responsibility. So I think that's the core of the question. Do you have a, a theory about that? Well, fundamentally, I'm a psychologist, and my experience has been that people can do a tremendous amount of good for themselves and for the people who are immediately around them by looking to their own inadequacies and their own flaws and the things that they're not doing in their lives and starting to build themselves up as more powerful individuals and if agreed um individual collective responsibility but again the, the clip goes on i recommend you check it out it's really interesting him in the whole q a kind of tearing apart people left and right um and again i i, I like he, I'm, i like when Jordan peterson gets challenged because i think it brings out the best in him he's able to kind of reformulate his ideas he's able to, re to explain things better in maybe quote-unquote layman's terms 
but I just it just never baffles me just how easily triggered dismantled and cut down some of these social justice warriors are when they get challenged on their opinion or when they get told information that doesn't match up to their realities like you know we're all we should be worried about things that are happening in the world but i think by and large i think especially off the back of this whole chloe kardashian jordan woods episode i think what i think most people have realized for the most part is that everyone has their shit everyone has their dramas that they go through even if you're a Kardashian, you have your mess situation that you just can't avoid life does hit you in the back of the head right but by and large worrying about other people's relationships and families dynamic is not going to do your life any good um maybe using it as a precautionary tale to say that maybe you know some people have that weird idea in their head that if they're rich and famous that they're not going to encounter any problems in life right maybe use the connection as an example of like oh no they have issues they have personal family issues that they go through like anyone else would maybe that's some lesson to pull from it but i think what we've seen with everyone kind of effectively looking at that interview um that happened with them jordan was on red table and also then the reply from chloe kardashian on twitter that was fucking bizarre where she essentially said jordan was was the person to blame and not tristan thomas we basically saw whoa like these people are just as stupid as we are right we're all dumb in this world right and it kind of felt like you wasted your time because essentially it was like, look, what you know, what what you thought was common knowledge, what you thought was easy to kind of deduce from the topic that Tristan Thomas is a fucking dickhead, right? And he's putting his families into jeopardy. That Chloe Kardashian doesn't feel the same way. Um, and it kind of felt like you wasted your time, right? You wasted precious, valuable minutes of your life focusing on this story. But I think we do that all the time with other things, right? Such as climate change, right? Such as, um, you know, the socioeconomic um, crisis that's happening, the job market. We worry about things that are outside of our control when we should be worrying about things that are inside of our control and then trying to work up to those issues, right? So getting our lives in order, um, essentially, I don't know, practicing um, good practices when it comes to recycling, when it comes to energy conservation, when it comes to charity work, and then, it's then trying to see if we can fix the broken system. But going in and going in with a hammer and trying to fix a system that seemed from you, from your understanding, from your side, seems to be not working, but it has worked for this long. Maybe ha if you m move some things around and change some things, you might end up fucking up things and it leading to unintended consequences that might be for the worse. So there is an idea behind it where there is an idea you have to really focus on your own before you are able to focus on other people. But nowadays it's hard to do because everyone wants to be parading around that they're a better person, that they're doing things for other people in the hope of seeming virtuous. And I think actually John Peterson mentions it. Actually, let me run the quip. I think he actually mentions that, you know, sometimes he feels that people do these things that, like, you know, stand behind, you know, uh, rally, rally about, rally around um, uh, climate change um, and uh, in, in order to kind of look good um, in front of their neighbours. Let's see if he mentions it here. If they're capable of doing that, and then they're capable of expanding their career. And if they're capable of expanding their career and their competence, then they're capable of taking their place in the community as effective leaders. And then they're capable of making wise decisions instead of unwise decisions when it comes well, to face beside him. She's so annoying. political decisions. I'm not suggesting in the least, and have never suggested that there's no domain for social action. I'm suggesting that people who don't have their own houses in order should be very careful before they go about reorganizing the world, which happens in many ways. And again, how could you not agree with that? That's the thing. Look at her face. How scrunched up. I don't know how you could not agree with that. People the, people should concentrate on fixing their own life before they can fix their boy in the world, which is true, right? The world is a very complex thing. It's a very nuanced thing. There are things involved in the world that are byproducts of bad decisions that sometimes change. No one thing can fuck up everything else on the side of it. And in general, you probably don't have the answers. You think you're smart, but you're probably not as smart as you think you are. That is essentially what it is. There needs to be a level of humility involved in it. But I think, you know, I think the fact that some institutions, sorry, the police call, I think that some institutions, the fact that we have so many dumb people in some roles, right? Some real inept people, I think has sometimes given the impression that everyone can't do that job. But I think the fact that some inept people work in these positions doesn't necessarily mean everyone can do it. That's my um conclusion on that one so, are you, can, you, can, can, can i just just to if a young person believes that the uh, climate the global warming um problem on the climate is something that needs to be tackled quickly and they can't wait until they grow up and become prime ministers to do it 
do, do you think collective responsibility overrides individual responsibility in a huge issue like that? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that generally, I think that generally, I think that generally people, I think generally people have things that are more within their personal purview that are more difficult to deal with and that they're avoiding and that generally the way they avoid them is by adopting uh, pseudo moralistic stances on large scale social issues so that they look good to their friends and their neighbors. Like. Ah, amazing! <laughs> I love him. I love him so much. Anyway, that brings an end to Action of Zinger show. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, today's been a bit of a weird one. I know I'm not really in the best of shapes, but I'm on the mend. I'm getting there. Uh, thanks again for tuning in. As always, if you want to see anything regarding more, go to my website, actionofzinger.com, or my listing on DJ Gigs, blog entries, all that sort of stuff is on there. And I guess I'll see you guys again on the other on the other end of it, right? Tomorrow, other end, I guess. Something like that. For those watching on YouTube, subscribe, like, share with your friends. For those of you on the podcasting apps, leave a review, five stars preferably, let your people know. And um, yeah, keep sharing, keep sharing, keep sharing. I'm on 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, man. I, I didn't think that would ever happen. That's fucking awesome. Um, thanks again for all of you that have been watching on YouTube and supporting the guy. And I hope to continue bringing you fresh content sometime during the week. Peace out. <laughs>